podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar session featuring experts from the Siemen Company, Access Communications, and Catalyst. Today, experts from each company will discuss how to convert buildings to act as operating systems designed for easy deployment of current and future smart building applications. I'm Brian Baum, Siemens Global Marketing and Communications Manager. Today's session will be a 90-minute interactive panel discussion moderated by Bob Allen. Bob is the Global Business Development Manager for Intelligent Buildings and Strategic Alliances for the Siemens Company. Prior to Siemens, Bob worked at Honeywell Building Solutions and has spent over 15 years in the IT industry. Recently, Bob was appointed as the Vice Chair of the Continental Automated Buildings Association's Intelligent Building Council. Before we begin the panel discussion, we'd like to make sure our audience is clear on how to submit questions during the webinar. If you do not see the full GoToWebinar panel on your screen, look for the small GoToWebinar widget on your desktop screen. The widget looks like what's represented on the left side of the PowerPoint slide. Once you locate the widget, click the orange arrow towards the top to expand the GoToWebinar panel. Once you can view the full panel, feel free to download handouts and or submit questions in the space below. We will answer questions as best we can during the panel discussion. There is time segmented at the end to cover as many questions as possible. Kindly note if your question is for a specific presenter so we can direct your questions accordingly. After the live session, we will be sure to follow up with answers to any questions that were not already covered. And before I hand the reins over to Bob Allen, we're going to start the webinar off with two poll questions for our audience. First poll question is, what are your most burning questions about intelligent buildings? Is it one, what is a smart building? Two, what are the benefits of smart buildings? Three, what core smart building technologies are required from the outset? Four, how will I manage a smart building? Or five, other? And so we'll pause here for just a quick moment to allow folks time to submit responses. Thank you for your responses. The next poll question is just for us to learn a little bit more about how, who is in our audience today, specifically what job roles people are in. Are you a C-suite level end user, a facilities manager, an IT infrastructure end user, a consultant or other? And we'll pause for just another moment to allow folks time to submit responses. Excellent. Thank you everyone for your responses and for joining us today. I'll now hand the reins over to our moderator and Siemens intelligent buildings expert, Bob Allen. Here's Bob. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate uh, setting us up and uh, all the help that uh, you've given us uh, logistically here. So I am with the Siemens company and we specialize in layer one infrastructure. We're a market leader in uh, copper fiber connectivity, patch panels, and so on. Uh, my role with the company is to work with our customers and our partners to be able to help define what an intelligent building is with our customers and then also help them be able to deliver on, um, on that intelligent building. With me today, I have two uh, great panelists. The first is Tersha Barrett, and she is the founder and managing director of Catalyst. She has more than 15 years experience in driving business growth through the effective use of technology and attained her MBA cum, a cum laude at Gordon Institute of Business Science with awards for her thesis on business model innovation. Tersha started Catalyst with the belief that technology can transform the workplace and modernize the employee experience. Tersha, can you tell us a little bit about Catalyst? Yes. So at Catalyst, Catalyst, we help companies create intelligent buildings that boost employee productivity and help them manage their facilities. And how do we do this? We use a combination of cutting edge IoT sensors and smart applications that empower employees to really interact with their building. And what that means in practice, it allows employees to have an app on their phone to see where can I work today, where's a meeting room available, 
how busy is the coffee shop or can I quickly run down to grab a cup? And that's what we do. Great. Thank you for that. We also have with us today Drew Pacino from uh, Axis. Drew Pacino has been with Axis uh, Communications for over five years, spending time in both sales and business development organizations. Drew's role on the partner ecosystem team is to manage relationships with strategic technology partners who provide complementary solutions to Axis products. He's based at the uh, Axis North America headquarters in Chelmsford, Chelmsford, Mass. Hi, Drew. Hey, Bob. Hey, thanks for the intro. So Drew Pacino, Axis Communications. If you're not familiar with Axis, we're a, a Swedish company. We also have a presence in over 50 other countries, including six offices in the US where I'm located. You may know Axis from our history with cameras. We actually invented the IP camera and brought it to market in 1996. But I'm here to tell you that we're not just a camera company. We have all sorts of other network devices, speakers, access control, door stations, software and services. Great, and thanks. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Did you want to ask that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you made an interesting uh, comment there during your uh, description of, of Axis that you're not just a camera company. And I think that is a little bit of a, a theme of what we're going to see today that uh, you know we're not just a cable manufacturing company and Kados is not just a, a sensor deployment company. So uh, hopefully we can dig into all of these little, uh, uh, these little offerings that our companies have and the roles that we play in intelligent buildings. So I think it probably makes sense to maybe go around the horn here and talk about what is an intelligent building. And maybe Drew, since uh, you have the mic, why don't you kick us off here? What, what do you see or what does Axis see as an intelligent building? Sure. So to me, an intelligent building is really like an operating system of interconnected devices, all increasing efficiencies and providing more value for the users. The buildings are, are designed with the future in mind, and ultimately they want to reduce the total cost of ownership and increase the, the ROI on that, that building investment. That's great, thanks. Uh, a lot of good uh, topics there as well. Cost of ownership, operational CapEx versus OpEx. Tricia, how do you view an intelligent building? So I'll just add to what Drew's already spoken about. And I think one of the things that's important to me is I've always found up to, up to now, intelligent buildings were really focused on the building. It's, it was all about increasing efficiencies, you know, tracking occupancy, et cetera. And I see the shift now. So to add to what Drew said is I do think an intelligent building needs to integrate existing business systems, which is very important. Otherwise there's just duplication of work. And it, it needs to allow the occupants access to that data. It needs to allow the occupants to interact with the building. And I think we'll increase, we'll have better efficiencies as a result. And that's kind of it. It can't be just the building in isolation anymore. It has to focus on the occupants and how they use it. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot uh, from both of you that you know the building now is more of a tool. It's less about the brick and mortar and you know keeping the elements out and the people in. It's more really a tool to success for the people within that uh, within that building. Uh, and I really like the uh, the graphic that we put together just to kind of illustrate where we all fit. In, um, in the actual physical structure of the building, uh, Seaman being the infrastructure that allows us to, to branch out with that IP infrastructure, connecting all the sensors and uh, cameras and other intelligent building devices. So I think if I were to chime in on what I see as an intelligent building, it's, uh, it's really a single unified infrastructure tying all of these systems that are traditionally in, in a siloed uh, means of design and deployment, but bringing them all together through an integration platform and using the data from all of these different systems to optimize the performance of, of the building itself. Yeah, uh, Drew, you touched on ROI right, uh, right in your, your opening statements there. So uh, let's talk about ROI. I think that's a real tricky thing to talk about because we don't really, well, it's hard to articulate it. It's hard to quantify it. So tell me, how do we see ROI? How do we measure ROI when we go through with an intelligent building? Sure, I think it's it's definitely a challenge. There's not always tangible metrics you can attach to that. I think a good way to measure ROI is really to look at your total cost of ownership first. And we have some great documentations on TCO and the Access website I, I'd encourage you to go look at. But essentially you need to find out what are the things that, that you are investing in? What is the, the total cost of a device lifecycle uh, combined with, with all the different devices you're using? 
And then what are some of the values you can take from using those devices that maybe aren't as tangible? And then how can you compare and contrast? Thanks. Trisha, anything you want to add to that? Then I think sensors yes. play a huge role in how we, how we can measure. Yes, absolutely. And I, I love doing the sum with clients when we interact with them because they normally come to us and they go, how are we going to convince business to spend the money? So the most recent research that was done say that 50% of your employees spend at least three weeks a year finding a place to meet. Okay, so now do the sum. So everyone grab a pen wherever you are at home, lying on your bed, still in your PJs, whatever. And just go, okay, how many employees have you got? Let's make it a thousand or whatever. And take half of them. And then work out what your average salary cost is. The average salary cost of a month. And work out what that salary cost of half of your employees is over a three week period. It is a significant amount. So we always find if you, if you actually do the sums, and we love doing it in client meetings, because inevitably when we say that stat, we have people going like this. Yes, <laughs> I know. I spend three weeks of my year searching for a meeting room. Or what my friend said the other day is, brand new building, everyone's in hot desking. And he said, Tosha, I take 20 minutes every morning finding a space to sit. So that salary cost is quite significant. And I do think sometimes we forget that your biggest impact can be that salary cost, employee productivity. So yes, that's my sum that I love doing with clients. That, and I appreciate you keeping the math simple for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's very interesting what you said too, because uh, we talk about things like hot desking or hoteling as it's referred to sometimes as well as a big productivity measure and a way of optimizing space in a facility. But that's kind of a, a, an underlying side effect of that losing 20 minutes every morning, just looking for a place before you can set up your laptop and port your phone. Uh, how does Catalyst help customers who want to deploy this type of a strategy in their office environment, but eliminate that 20 minute window. Absolutely. So, and a client actually said it perfectly the other day. She said, Tosha, we're implementing the new way of working. We've done it. We've got people in, we've got this brilliant strategy. And after talking to you, I've just realized this is not going to work without technology. So what's the whole idea? So we spoke about in, on the picture you see on screen, you can see the different sensors and the sensors, for instance, will track. How full is that training room? How full is the coffee shop? How many people are in this meeting room? And what our technology does, so we use this combination of sensors that track how people use the space and employees have an app on, our, on their phones and everyone's always got their phones with them. So as I'm walking with and I've just seen Bob and we have to have a meeting, I can literally go on my phone and go, where's the spot available for us right now? We're just looking for two people, but we're gonna need a screen and a whiteboard because we talk a lot and we draw. And I can go and see what's available right now. And I can even go as far as to say, hang on, that one's booked, but no one's in there. And it's already 15 minutes after the meeting started. So let me go there right now. Now, if you think about that in a building that's got eight floors, thousands of employees, 400 meeting rooms, to do that kind of cycle every day just wastes a crazy amount of time. Now I sure. can go in and see space to work. And in addition, I can also see where my colleagues are. Because especially now, as we're going back to the office, people aren't just going back to the office to sit at a desk. They're going back to the office to integrate, to meet their colleagues. And you'd be able to see where's Bob sitting today. I'm not going to sit near him. He talks too much. It's Drew. Okay, I'll go sit on the fifth floor where he is. Oh, and there's five desks available. Let me go sit there. You know, I do laugh about that because uh, even though you know, we're currently working from home in a lot of cases, myself included, uh, what I'm presenting, I'm still animated and I walk around my office here uh, as if I was in front of people. So I could totally understand not wanting to sit next to me in the office. <laughs> Drew, uh, you know, cameras add a whole different element to that, right? We start with sensor data. Um, perhaps it's even the cameras that are triggering this data and that are then pulling information from the other sensors. How, how do you fit into that? Um, that role, specifically, I guess, about conference rooms or even hot desking, as we're talking about right now. Yeah, there's really so many things you can do. I mean, you could you could buy a camera, a speaker, a door station, but the unique factor is that they can all work together. They, they can all talk to each other. They can all tie into something like like Catalyst occupancy as well. Uh, it's really the the possibilities are are almost endless. You can 
have a camera trigger a speaker. You can have when somebody walks in a door that triggers the camera to go off. And whatever mm -hmm. combination you're going to do is is something that that is possible in today's world, uh, depending on on how you want to set it up and and what your problem is. And then how about how are you going to go about solving that problem? It's really sort of a a transfer of data from the various devices and then using that data to to be more valuable than uh, as, as a whole than than as a sum of one. Yeah, and you know, in order to do that and pull all the data together, fortunately for us, we need an infrastructure to do it. And there's obviously a couple of different ways, depending on uh, the whether it's a retrofit, whether it's a, a new construction. And typically in new construction, we're seeing a, a physical uh, cabled infrastructure as compared to the wireless just for um, stability, for reliability, uh, and so on. And I've asked, I get asked a lot, uh, how do we, what's the strategy for the infrastructure to support all the things we're talking about today as well as the other devices in the building and i, I can tell you that uh, the first thing that we look at is the the cable itself and we look towards something that's very robust like a, a 6a shielded solution so that we have two main um uh, two main considerations there one is the ability to transfer data even though a lot of the things we're talking about today may be low bandwidth today when we're looking at a 20-year infrastructure that you want that capability going forward because the last thing you want to have to do is is re, uh, you know replace your cable infrastructure while uh, in the first twenty or thirty years or so. And the second, and right now in today's uh, climate, is the ability to deliver power to edge devices. And we find that having a more robust infrastructure is uh, has a greater capability of carrying higher power loads. Where now we're we're almost at hundred watts of power delivery through the low voltage infrastructure. Uh, I think cameras would probably be more concerned with the power delivery aspect, first bandwidth uh, today. What um, most of your cameras run on PoE, Drew? Kind of what uh, level? How much power do they require? Have a low to high. It really depends on the what type of camera you're using. The the majority of cameras are, are really running uh, in low voltage applications uh, and mm -hmm. won't require and. An, uh, too much too much power but maybe if you're doing some advanced features like a, a pen tilt zoom camera or maybe you're asking the camera to do certain things like like running analytics then maybe that's going to draw a little bit more and you need to and need to provide more power to get there but either way it, it's still extremely important whether you're drawing low power or high power if it's not there then it's not going to work correctly so it, it's a key part of the, of the equation yeah. In terms of the sensors, I assume they're not uh, big bandwidth consumers right now. Tell us kind of how they work on a low voltage infrastructure. So we all our sensors run off your cabling infrastructure. And it's become so important when we interact with customers is because our data, the data that the sensors collect, the data that the cameras collect have become business critical. So that infrastructure, that solid, stable, Infrastructure has become so important to the customers that we work with because the speed and consistency of collecting the data and sending it through to the right systems is absolutely critical. Because we can't we can't afford being down, we can't afford being off, we can't afford be the Wi-Fi system not working. That consistency of cabling has become really, really important to the solutions that we roll out to customers. Yeah, that's great to hear. And we also uh talk about a zone topology, which is where we actually cable to a zone enclosure and from there are able to patch to the different devices in a building. Uh, something that I don't know if it's happening a lot right now, but I see moving forward in intelligent buildings is the ability to have dynamic space. And that might mean moving sensors or adding sensors or cameras or lights and things like that. Uh, so we've at the same company have tried to make our infrastructure so, um, so dynamic that we're able to accommodate that. I know we do our best to design buildings up front, but are there cases where you realize, oh, we need another sensor in a certain place? You know, that just it didn't work out on paper, sort of thing, or maybe the needs of that building changed. I don't know. Do you? That, want... Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely uh, the case. You know, as, as much as you test things and, and plan things, uh, maybe, maybe it doesn't always go to to your plan, right? Uh, so. Uh, where did this wall come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so really, I mean, one of the advantages of intelligent buildings is looking towards the future. So if you put something in, uh, then you're not locked in for 10 years. You're not, it's not, it's not a waste of money, right? You can, 
kind of look at what happened and then go back to the drawing board if needed. So there, there's a lot of different cameras that, that can accommodate different functionalities. Uh, there's certain cameras that can sort of reposition themselves based on, on, on what's in the room and, and things like that. So uh, we're always looking forward and the goal is never to lock anyone into uh, to a bad situation. And if I could add to that, you would typically find, I mean, just think of any business, you're constantly growing, you're constantly adding new products, new divisions, pe people leave the business, they start again. So even if your plan was flawless in the beginning and you went, this is the way it's going to work and we've got the perfect infrastructure, a training room suddenly has to become 20 desks um, or we need to add a training room. So that agileness has become very important. And I do think it's so important for us to be able to have that flexibility to go, we need not just one cable, we need to deploy 20 sensors in the space. And how do we do this quickly? So again, you know, this really ties into the theme of our webinar today, the plug and play building, the ability to, uh, we need an extra sensor, we need a, a, whatever that edge device is, being able to connect it quickly, tie it into the operating system. Um, I know the three of us talk a lot, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, but we need to think about our buildings similar to the way we think about our smartphones, where we can literally just download an app and deploy it in our building that solves a need, be it an entertainment need, a productivity need, a safety need, um, but fast deployment and, and seamless deployment with all the systems within that building. Yeah. Uh, Drew, I've noticed that the, the role of cameras has shifted a little bit uh, from just pure security features to more operations aspects. Shed some light on that for us. Sure, so I think today you're finding that uh, both security and operations can can benefit in some of the, the values that cameras bring. Whereas in the past, it was uh, purely viewed as a, as a security function. But now they're, they're doing a lot more things rather than just protecting against stuff. They're, you're bringing in business operations, you're bringing in uh, analytics into to a store or a building. Uh, you know, are these are these processes we have set up correct? Can we be doing these things better? So these are things that operations is looking at, and they're finding that the cameras can be used for multiple purposes. Sure, it could it could help prevent somebody from coming into a building and stealing valuable items, but it could also be used to, to optimize employee flow and make sure that uh, things are really being used to the best of their ability. So. I think the operations department would be highly interested to, to look at some of the the other use cases of of cameras and devices rather than just the obvious one. And, you know, you're going to have cameras anyway, right? Because it, they are a security feature. So being able to multi-purpose those cameras can only improve the uh, the bottom line of organization. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So can the sensor network and the cameras be tied together? to even in, improve the productivity within the company even more. Go ahead. <laughs> I get so excited. Actually, I'm glad you asked. Um, and I feel like my, one, of, one of our clients here, what they've done is obviously with COVID, it kind of phased people coming back to the office and they've got reduced capacity. But the big thing now is if someone tests positive, we want to know who they interacted with. And it's this mixture because our solution on our software, you'd actually say, well, I can come to the office Mondays and Fridays, so I'll book my spot to the office. So we know exactly who came to the office, which days, and which floor they were going to work on. But our clients are going one level deeper. They said, okay, cool. So we can see which floor he worked on. We can see everyone who was on, sorry, on the floor on that day, but who else did he interact with? So we ping him with the cameras from Access, and we actually kind of saw, is there any anyone that they interacted with quite closely. So just as a result of COVID, um, we're seeing this whole new whole new way of tracking people for safety Contact reasons. Tracing, right? yeah. I am watching what you do. So easier to pinpoint the uh, people who need to quarantine. Yeah, yeah, and that's quite yeah. important. That's great. Uh, Tasha, tell us about some of the new building applications that are coming into the market or you know, different types of intelligent building systems that are available today. So I've started speaking about this already, because if you look at, you know, at the event of IoT, all the sensors that came out were all focused on the building and we measuring everything, water usage, energy usage, lights, I can go on. And, and all the applications kind of 
that interact with it are also focused on the building, these tenant management, um, property management, building management, water management. And really we've seen this shift. So the shift towards the occupants of the building and really the shift towards how the employees who use the building every day interact with the building. So the technology that's available at the moment, they vary. So from the one hand, we have solutions where employees, you know, we always have the age old fight in the building to go, I'm too cold, Bob is too hot. The air comes too cold, they have to like, wear a jersey or a blanket and this person sits and everyone laughs because everyone's got that space at the office where people always fight about the temperature. In fact, we had one at our office last week. And what we do now is we've got sensors throughout the building tracking the temperature. And we can tell you exactly in that spot, how does the temperature fluctuate during the day? So for instance, as people arrive in the morning, you know, when the aircon people come to fix the aircon on Saturdays, it works perfectly, but no one's there. And we can actually we track occupancy of the building, we track CO2, we track temperature, and we tell you how that fluctuates as people, as more people into, are at the office. And employees are able to, on their phones, go, I'm too cold, Bob's going, I'm too hot. And what the sensors do is they kind of track where the temperature is, they interact with the actual aircon and they go, we're gonna just shift it a degree. So we're not gonna give it Bob's temperature, we're not gonna give it Tertius temperature, we're just gonna <laughs> kind of find that middle way, yeah. which is really quite cool and people love it. And at the same time, it's that those apps that I spoke about earlier where people wanna find a hot desk that's available or a quiet space, because I'm going to do a video call or I need to do a budget and I just need to find that space where I can work. And that goes all the way from when we arrive at the office. So if I remember, you know, normally when you'd have a meeting at a client, you'd arrive at reception, you'd normally have to arrange parking up front because there's no parking in the city. So parking up front, you arrive there, you wait 15 minutes, they need a DNA lock of hair before they check you into the building. And then someone comes down and they fetch you to take you to a meeting room which was booked three weeks ago and now has other people in it. So that, mm -hmm. does that sound familiar? You've all been through that journey of the office before? Everyone's always, yes, yes, that happens to you all the time. And the technology now allows me to check in beforehand. So I can register my car, I can put in my details, DNA lock of hair on the app on my phone. I get a QR code and as I arrive at the building, I scan the QR code. I drive in because it recognizes my QR code. Me driving in pings a notification to the people that I'm seeing that Tersh has arrived. And I literally walk up to reception, the person's kind of there already. And if people were still in the meeting room that we had booked three weeks ago, they're able to actually see that before we walk there. So all of that's kind of integrated, this whole kind of visitors, employee application, sensors, how we get there to really just make that whole process very seamless. Yeah, a great point. You know, um, I heard a great statistic, 35% of conference room reservations go unused, but they're still yes. booked. And, and I'm so guilty of that. You know, I have recurring meetings, mostly Mondays. And if I take a vacation day or I'm traveling that day, I always forget to cancel my meetings. And so I am one of those uh, people that contribute to that 35%. So I'd like to thank Bob for people needing our technology. Thank you very much for <laughs> exactly. doing one of those. I'm, I'm an enabler, aren't I? <laughs> Drew, I mean, uh, so everyone is very familiar we know what cameras are things like that but tell me uh give me a system or a function in the building that cameras can help with or improve or communicate with integrate with that i may not be just thinking of that off the, off the top of my head sure so like i said most people associate a camera with somebody trying to steal something or or something of that nature right but say you take a a, a building cafeteria for example you know, not only are you monitoring the employee compliance, you're, you're monitoring the customers, uh, maybe you're looking at something like a, a queue monitoring. So you're, you're saying, okay, is this, is this line efficient? Uh, do we need to call somebody else to, to help with the, the checkout? Uh, do we need to rearrange things to make that work more efficiently? And then also you could tie that into smart lighting or HVAC sensors. So then maybe if you don't have people in the cafeteria in certain times of the day, you, you could dim the lights or, uh, de or increase the heating or decrease the heating. And, and all that's really, that's adding up to, to a, a lot of, uh, maybe not necessarily tangible data, but it's, it's really adding to the, the value of your building. 
and you know not only are you getting security but you're getting operations for the business operations uh, and then and then uh, environmental uh, of environmental nature with the the heating and the lighting and trying to reduce those costs as well so it's really about you know what what problems do you have that can be solved by the camera and then kind of what other costs are associated that maybe it can influence that's great uh, <clears throat> really good stuff so we've talked a lot about the operational side and ways we can improve efficiency uh in in a building i want to touch on the capital cost side of building a building because you do um cameras are an expense sensors are an expense but what we're seeing now is when we put all these technologies together and we design a building holistically from the building to be an intelligent building we're actually lowering the cost to build the buildings um here in the us we're lowering the cost by over two million dollars per hundred thousand square feet of construction and a lot of that's due to leveraging things like poe so we have one cabled infrastructure that's delivering power communication and control rather than having to bring traditional AC power and then a communication cable along with it. In the case of what you guys are doing, I'll start with uh, with sensors. There has to be a lot of traditional sensors in a building that can be eliminated with, through redundancy by deploying a, a sensor network that is doing all these other benefits that we're talking about, whether it be the hoteling, finding um, conference rooms and so on. Can you talk a little about that? So it's quite interesting, the, the technology that exists at the moment, so you're saying which old sensors, they aren't. Like, do we need thermostats so in spaces anymore? You know, yes. traditional thermostats, yes. do we need <laughs> stuff like that? I didn't even think that they would come up. <laughs> but what we're seeing is, it's like I said, I think the sensors that we had, or that are in place of buildings at the moment, are very much focused on the building. So mm -hmm. do the aircons do their job? Do they have the right temperature? Um, you know, over here, we've got sensors on geysers because, you know, in a building, very nice office building, if a geyser bursts, the damage that it does is quite significant, um, especially if it's close to a, a server room. But what we're seeing is this shift in mindset is introducing a whole bunch of new sensors. So we spoke with you just mentioned the cost saving when building building buildings. And we have a client who fits 30 percent more employees in a space 3% smaller than before. Really? That's a, massive, that's a massive saving on the type of building that they built. And how they actually got to that information is they deployed the sensor to track how the people are using the space in the building, how the desks being used, how the meeting rooms being used, how the collab rooms being reused, the ones with the bean bags, the ones with the screen. So they tracked how the space was being used. And with that data, they were able to see, hang on, our desks are only utilized, or in this department, this division, 30% of the time. And these desks are main, um, utilized 60% of the time. So with that data, they could actually create a new space or create a new building that was much more efficient than before. And, and that's what's quite interesting, because when people often talk about building efficiency, people think, I'm going to squeeze more people into less space, which means desks are getting smaller, like they did with call centers years ago. They're still getting smaller. You're going to sit really close to the people next to us. It's a smaller space, but it's completely opposite. It's if you look at the new smart intelligent buildings being built today, they massive open spaces. You know, the desks aren't close together. It's really well, really openly designed. But where they're getting that efficiency is we're building the building based on actual usage. And you mentioned so earlier. So spatial analytics is huge. Yeah, absolutely. And what if we actually need to change a room? Now they've got data. I had one client who was about to embark on a massive project to build a whole bunch of meeting rooms downstairs. And when they checked utilization of the meeting rooms, they went, hang on, they only used 40% of the time. Yet exactly what you said earlier, they booked 65% of the time. But now they have the data. So they could go back to business and said, hang on, this is the actual stats. And now they can make decisions. So one, we don't need to embark on that massive expensive project to build additional meeting rooms we could actually just fix the root cause which was the pa who booked a meeting room just in case and bob who books meeting rooms all the time and never goes to the office so by eliminating that kind of change in behavior they were really able to optimize the space and because it's a continuous process 
companies change, the way people work change. Every month, they actually do it quarterly. Every quarter, they report on what are the changes we're seeing. More collaboration, less meeting rooms. Um, the big meeting rooms that we have are only used by about four people, and they're still quite full. So let's make them smaller and create more of those. So it's, it's very much an ongoing thing all the time. And Drew mentioned, I said it so well earlier, where he said, tell us what problem you've got to solve. And then it's really about working back and say, hang on, let's start tracking this. Let's start measuring that. Let's start reporting on this and helping you make the right decision. Yeah, and, you know, the, the digital building concept totally supports everything that you just said. And I love the conference room uh, reference you made there about you know, every company has to have a big conference room. You have to be able to yes. host 15, 20 people. But you know, the twice a year you do it, it's really not good, efficient use of space. Because we're designing buildings as IP buildings uh, and everything is so configurable, we can actually have dividers in those rooms. So the divider closes, the light switch on this side of the room only controls those lights and same over here. And then when it's open, all the switches control all the lights. Um, you know, from a, a surveillance perspective, cameras can automatically adjust to that space uh, when things are triggered uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, data is great. We, we talk about data in, in buildings now. It's, it's wonderful. We're talking about a lot of the, but data does no good unless it's actionable. So who is, how are companies changing organizationally to act upon this data? Or are they changing? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I like both your perspectives on this. <laughs> Did warn you. So Tisha also talks a lot. You don't want to sit close to her. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting and why, why I want to talk about it is we've even seen a shift in COVID. So we, these types of decisions were often, often driven by facilities management. We've kind of seen the shift where how the workspace or how the office is designed is done by a workspace committee. I think they have better names than that, but that's pretty much what they do. And what it does is they incorporate different parts of the business. So we've got facilities management because they really understand the space. But we've incorporated finance because they need to understand the costs. We've incorporated the CIO because they're the ones who pioneer what systems the business is going to implement. And we've definitely seen this wave of HR being part of those meetings because it's all about optimizing, you know, helping employees get more productive, but it's also getting the most of our employees. So what we've seen with this committee of people actually having these discussions the data is great, but now you have data to say, okay, but why, let's understand why does that happen? So here's a, another great example. Um, we spoke about everyone needs a big order, everyone does. And our systems will track to say, but your 18 seater is only used by two people. And then some clients say, it's the client facing boardroom. We have to make an impression. I don't care if it's one person or two person, two people, it's the client facing boardroom. It's fine. We don't care. But in these, we do care and we can actually sh shuffle them. So one of the root cause of bad building and um, bad meeting room usage was they tracked it was one person, one person in the 18 seats, one, why? And they realized after tracking the one person, because we integrate with the booking systems and Outlook and whatever calendar application you use, and we asked the person, why do you keep using booking the 18 seater? You're just one person. He says, well, it's the only conference room with video conferencing both of So it's really understanding the services in each room and how they're impacting the productivity yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Drew, any insight on that as well? Yeah, I think you're just seeing more sharing of, of data within organizations. For instance, like security and IT, maybe they're two separate departments in a building, but uh, you know, everyone's budget is tight, right? I don't think anyone has excess budget all the time. So if security and IT find that they they can share uh, with the same device and, and both get functions from that, then that's something they're probably interested in pursuing because it's going to help both of them. So the the data that maybe was siloed in an organization before, it's, it's benefiting multiple different types of people and it's probably in their best interest to communicate it and figure out how to take advantage of that. Yeah. 
Great. Hey, and, and that leads me to another uh, topic of an integration platform within a building. Because again, it's great to have all this data, but the ability to share it with other systems and having kind of that single pane of glass uh, integration platform, allowing people with specific functions in a building to drill into what they need to, people who have more overarching responsibility in a building, being able to see uh, kind of everything going on, a snapshot of that. Drew, how does, uh, how does an access system tie into an integration platform for a building? Sure, so from day one, we've been very, very open with sharing information to uh, video management system partners, device management system partners, because it's essential for someone to be able to, to manage all the devices on the network. So we have an open API for access products that allows a uh, what we call the VMS, the video management system, to essentially get any functionality out of that camera or, or, or speaker, whatever it is, and then you know if they have other cameras or, or other devices or maybe occupancy sensors uh, it could manage everything on on one network uh, and sometimes maybe you might need to bring different softwares in there like you need something for for video then a device management uh, but it's really allowing you to look at everything all at once and not having to pull up multiple different interfaces and, and driving yourself crazy because uh, you want to make ease of use really number one and so that's what's driving these companies to uh, to be able to succeed uh, and it's it's in somebody like Access's best interest really to share all this information as, as openly as possible so that uh, once again it's really all about the the customer interaction and making sure that it's it's easy to use and that's really where you're going to get your biggest benefit in an intelligent building is having that uh, integration platform software to bring all of this data and all these systems together uh, tush you want to add to that what do you what do you see as benefits of an integration platform when you, your systems are deployed i think it I almost think it's a key success factor to actually make this all work, is if you're not integrating, if you don't have this core system that integrates all the data and integrate with existing business systems, not the siloed approach, this is the building and everything around it, but we integrate with Calendar and Outlook. And we actually understand what are the daily tasks that our people need to do that really integrates it really well and gives you the insight you need to make the right decisions to move forward optimize, improve efficiencies, et cetera. Do you see any challenges with an integration platform, whether it be uh, from just, and not just with your particular systems, but do you see any challenges with bringing all these systems into that single pane of glass? Uh, go ahead, I'll just let you take it from there. So firstly, it's not, it's not easy. So it, you have to start with this vision. What are you trying to achieve? What are the problems you need to solve? And then work back. And we've got, um, we work with one of the consulting firms who've done really well. They've, they've kind of built this platform that integrates all the different data and added predictive analytics to it. So not only do they have data to actually see what this is happening, what decisions do we need to make? He, for instance, he told us that based on the data that they've collected and the predictive analytics, by the 4th of December, they would have reached maximum capacity allowed in the building according to um, our latest government regulations from a COVID perspective. Mm -hmm. So you could predict that to the building. And based on that predictive analytics, they could actually say, they, based on that growth, we're going to need more cleaners on those days, at those times. What day of the week are people coming in? Um, how does that affect what we need to do? How does that affect, you know, we, you spoke about the canteen just now. If you have more people, canteen needs to be operating busy but we've only had 20 people at the office they don't need that staff so they're really using that data but the reason that they've succeeded is they really had a very clear vision of what they wanted to achieve so i think the first challenge is if you don't know what you want to achieve and i know this is kind of standard we've all been through it i don't know what the business wants to achieve you do, um you're going to build a very long time on a platform and it's never going to answer any of your questions I have a hard enough time figuring out what I need for dinner, let alone in my building. So, yeah, I could see that being a challenge. Drew, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think integration definitely can be a challenge. Uh, one of the ways we try to work through that is by using a common language. We have an API for all our products that lets you do the advanced bells and whistles and, and the fancy things. But then there's also an industry standard called ONVIF, uh, O-N-V-I-F. And that essentially ensures that you can pull a stream from the camera. No matter what camera it is, if, it, if it's... Uh, tagged with this ONVIF profile, then you can get functionality out of it. So, so it's really important to have some of those common factors uh, because otherwise you need to 
you know, with hardware, you're going to have to have a lot of tech technical documentation and kind of looking towards the future and making sure that you know, things are integrated and, uh, you know, there's not potential firmware roadblocks and all sorts of things. Uh, so it it's, simplifies it if you have a common language that, that doesn't change over time. And that someone, no matter what the, the new feature is, function, it's, you know, they know this, they're familiar with this, and, and they can work with it. So when we're looking at construction projects, there are different uh, stakeholders, there are different teams involved, uh, depending on the use of the building. It's not always owner occupied. They're not always the builder. So, you know, in particular, we have core and shell companies, right? They go in, they build the, the bones of the building, not knowing what that use case is going to be. And oftentimes it ends up being mixed use. How do, how do we look at intelligent buildings from the very basic core to make sure that we're, we're setting it up What's the benefit there to those folks to be thinking about an intelligent building for the occupants, not even knowing who they might be? For the God. for the builder? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. If I'm a core and shell builder, uh, you know, I'm used to just, I guess, you know, putting in the major HVAC components and and erecting the concrete and steel, and then turning it over to in pieces to the occupants. What are right. some of the considerations well, I need to take at that begin those beginning stages? For for that type of person, they, they probably want to increase the value of the building, right? So by building something that that won't be future proof and, and scalable, it's it's probably not going to help them increase that that value. So it's it's really in their best interest to to make this as customizable as possible, so that when it gets to the next step, that then somebody is satisfied and then can really take that even even further. Yeah, and we say that with the infrastructure all the time, that it needs to be thought about and deployed at that early stage, because no matter who that occupant is, there's added value there being able to come in, set up quickly and move on. Go ahead, Tertia. Absolutely. Um, I was just thinking of, a, when you asked the question, I was thinking of a conversation I had a year ago with someone who does exactly that. And when we told them what we do, I said, well, why would anyone want to do that? Like, why? Why would you want a smart building? They just tell us what we need to build and we build it. And then I completely add to what Drew said earlier. I think, you know, the, the pushback these guys often get is if I make if I make the cost too expensive, I won't be able to lease it. If I make the cost too expensive, they'll go to a different supplier or a different building. And I think everything we've spoken about so far is about that cost of ownership, but what's the return on investment? And I think it's so important for those people to go, hang on, let's look at this differently. What do companies actually want? So if you can prove to a company we're building a space with the right technology, the right infrastructure, which means that your employees won't waste time finding space to work. And what impact will that have on your company's productivity? I just think it changes the conversation they have with their clients. It's just a different, a completely different value offering. And I think in this current day and age where we, you know, business has become so competitive, everyone's always looking for that edge. What's going to differentiate us from the next guys? And I do think in the space, this still differentiates you from your competition. So kind of keeping along that same line, how does the use of the data or the value of the data differ from a landlord to a tenant? Is there value to both of those stakeholders? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's probably different use cases, right? I think the the owner of the building is is focused on increasing value of that building, and maybe some of those uh, some of those things like uh, lighting and, and HVAC and, and making sure that you can keep costs low while, while keeping profits high. Uh, whereas the tenant might be interested in more uh, applicable use cases, like you know, how, how is someone using this building? How, how is how is my employees being productive? As as Tertia said earlier. Um, you know, how can we maximize people actually doing things in the building versus the owner, uh, whereas the owner might be concerned with uh, the processes of the building itself. So, so they're both really important things and uh, they, they can absolutely work together, uh, but the, the two people might have different goals in mind. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tricia. So just to add to that, we, um, definitely, we're definitely seeing that shift. That shift is starting to happen. So a few years ago, it was, this is my building, take it or leave it. And like I said, we've seen, because there's more space available, especially with the WeWorks of the world and the sharing spaces popping up, there's been a lot of open office space. 
in our mm -hmm. cities, in our main business centers. And that's kind of created the shift. So we actually had a, um, the word I'm looking for, a facilities management company, an outsourced facilities management company. So their whole business up to now was always focused on cleaning, cleaning spaces, security, et cetera. That's their whole business model. But the shift has changed their thinking. So they came to us and did a, how do we differentiate ourselves with customers? And it's that shift that's happening at the moment. So, and I think business is driving a lot of that. Business is saying, you know, we are, like Drew said, no one's got extra, extra budget. We're looking at saving costs, but where can we save costs most? What can make the biggest impact to our business? So companies are more demanding. The landlord can't just say, take it or leave it. They've got sure. more competition. In shift, And everyone's thinking, how can I future-proof my business? How can I be more attractive? And there must be value to both sides of knowing uh, whether they're really outgrowing that space or not. And I can I can see a situation as a landlord, you always want to retain good tenants. Tenants, if they're comfortable in a building and, and their business is working there, they don't want to have to move. So if you had businesses side by side and and have the, the information to be able to say that this company over here on one side, uh, they're really underutilizing their space while the one next door is kind of bursting at the seams. We might be able to move a little wall here, lower one's rent, increase the other, and keep two happy tenants rather than have losing two tenants. Exactly. And I think the biggest challenge that we come across with companies now is, especially now, everyone's going, well, people are definitely working more flexible. I've got a lot of people working from home. Do I still need my two offices? And the question is they can't answer the question at the moment. They don't know. Because there's right. not enough data to tell them this space is being used often, that space is being used. So they keep flipping. They go, this week, no, we're going to close that office. You know, hardly anyone uses it. We don't think it justifies the cost to, ooh, we've realized our clients like going to that office because it's closer to them, not necessarily closer to our employees. So we're keeping that office again. And I think that just ties in with what you said, that data, someone has to look at it, I agree. Always, someone has to look at the data. But sure. Data is so important, and we're so used to these days getting information to make decisions that I do feel buildings kind of need to catch up. We need to start measuring this data so we can make better decisions. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, I think too, when we talk about buildings, I bet you the bulk of our audience right now has this vision that we're talking about big buildings. So, what is uh a minimum size that it makes sense. I mean, obviously, if you have a need for a camera, you have a need for a camera. So, Drew, I'm kind of talking outside of just the basic security need of a camera, how it ties into operational and, and everything else. So, why don't you kick us off? Is there a minimum size building that it starts to make sense? I, I don't think there's a minimum or a maximum, uh, in my opinion here. I think whether you have one device, one camera, one speaker, or a thousand, it, it's, it's going to be it's going to help you you achieve your goal. Uh, and once again, I've said it before, what is the problem you're trying to solve? So if that problem is solved by by one speaker or a thousand speakers, then, then that's great. Uh, and it's really sort of, you know, what are you trying to solve and, and what do you need to get there? We're not out there trying to push as many devices as possible, but we're just trying to help you achieve your goal. Nice. Tersh, would you like to add to that? Absolutely. So we've got a, again, a practical example. So we've got a client who've got multiple offices spread across the country and some of them are small and then they've got obviously head office and the main business centers. But what is the business? What is the problem they're trying to solve? So the one problem they're trying to solve is, do we need all these offices spread all over the country? So they actually want to track how the small offices are being used because maybe they don't need them anymore. But they don't know, and especially because out of sight, out of mind, they really don't know. They can't even say who's there, okay, 10 people every day. They don't have the data. So we've seen that when they want to solve the problem, like how many do we even use these? We're actually pushing technology to the smaller offices first to see do we need those for that space. So it's all about starts with what problem are you trying to solve, and then we, we adjust. And I think that's great because uh, obviously both systems being in an intelligent building have remote capabilities, monitoring facilities, people who may not be at all the time, counting people in other locations. Uh, but, you know, we're moving data around over the Internet, the cloud, on-prem, all these different things. Security is is a real issue for people. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a stumbling block or a challenge that we need to understand and, and better um, be able to manage that. How how do you approach the security side of this, Tarsha? 
So from a software perspective, all our technology is GDPR compliant. So when we transfer data, when we send data, everything's secure. And every client we deal with, we normally have pages and pages and pages and pages of infosec requirements that we need to complete before we even walk into the building. That sounds overwhelming. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's not worth it, but it's but interesting what we are seeing in our space. So we do a lot of work with banks and financial institutions, investment banks, and their confidentiality is everything. So part of what we need to prove with our sensors is that we don't take any photos. In certain mm -hmm. meeting rooms, in certain spaces, we have to prove that our occupancy sensors don't actually take pictures. Where someone can zoom in and see what was on my screen or hear the discussion. So it really it depends on the client. And in certain spaces, they don't have cameras for that security perspective. So every client is different, but we are definitely, it's one of the biggest things that we have to deal with with every client that we interact with. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. I think you know, people, when we think of security, we think of hackers getting into the network and that sort of thing, but we don't think of just a video camera that can zoom in on my PowerPoint or whatever it is I'm working on, uh, which is a great segue, Drew, into the cameras and security side here. But tell us about both sides of the security and how you guys approach that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a uh, something that gets brought up quite a bit, probably in every single sales meeting that, that we have. You know, somebody's asking about that, right? Uh, but I think often people think of it as more of a complicated matter than it is sure our devices we're doing everything possible to make sure that they're they're hardened and, and preventing against this but it's the, the bigger concern might be education and making sure people know what steps to take to to harden their own devices you know you could have a device that's the most secure thing in the world and if if the password is called password then then you know anyone can get into it so <laughs> i need a minute to password, <laughs> password dash one, two, three. <laughs> Yeah, simple steps like two-factor authentication. It, you know, it sounds very simple, but you're you're probably 50% at least more secure than you were before just by that that one that one step. Uh, and just making sure people change their passwords and, and understand uh, what's secure, what's not secure. What what are the basic steps I can do to protect myself and my organization? So we, you know, our device is only secure as secure as as the person that that's using it. Uh, so you know. We're doing a lot of things on the hardware side uh, to make that easier, but it's really all about education and making sure that people know what they can do to, to personally take that even further. So common sense still plays a role. That's kind of what I'm hearing in both, yep. from both of you. <laughs> Very much do not use password as a password. <laughs> uh, so we talked a bit about economic models, ROI, uh, OPEX, CAPEX, that sort of thing. Are there certain aspects of automation that make the most sense that should be concentrated on. Um, you know, uh, kind of give you an example here. Uh, we talk about looking at things holistically, but sometimes that's not always practical. So when I look at the CapEx model and the deployment of intelligent buildings using power over ethernet as much as possible should be a top focus for lowering that capital cost. When we take the things that you guys are doing and we want to tie that into other systems within the building, where should we be focusing as our number one low hanging fruit? This is priority has to get done. Uh, Drew, you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah, I guess in the in the case of, of security devices, uh, one factor to consider would be bandwidth and storage. You know, you have all these all these fancy devices, they're they're generating all sorts of data. How, how are you going to store that? Is your network capable of, of doing things like that? Uh, so there's certain technologies that are very important to to dealing with this, uh, such as something we call we call Zipstream, uh, and it's essentially compressing data that's that's really not being used. If you walk through the screen and you're the only thing that moves, then it's going to capture you, but maybe it doesn't need to capture the wall at full resolution. So learning where you can and i wouldn't say cut corners it's just le learning where you can focus is essential because you know what's happening you can't afford to to miss a second of a video or, or something like that but if you realize that you don't need to be recording on what's not happening then maybe that's that's going to save you thousands of dollars over the course of the year so learning what's what's essential to you and then focusing that prioritizing that over 
other things might be one way I'd look at that. Yeah, I don't know that I would say cut corners, but really you're optimizing resources is exactly. what you're doing by doing that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tricia, any comments on that? Again, to me, every client's different and starts with what are the strategic goals of the company? That's the first one. What are the problems you're trying to solve to get you there? And what we find, what do you do first? Infrastructure is, is really, really important. I'm not just saying that because of you. But if the infrastructure is not right, and we do come across it, if it's not current, if it's completely outdated, or someone didn't think it was important to actually install the right infrastructure to actually future-proof their business, we do come across those kind of walls. We just hit a wall and we go, this is a technology, everyone buys in. Yes, we're going to do this. This is awesome. And we go, oh, no, the infrastructure is just completely outdated. And, you know, we went for the cheapest thing at the time and we can't actually do it. And then we often go back and go, okay, let's rewind. Let's narrow it down. What can we do now? Mm -hmm. And then build that infrastructure, put the right things in place, and then add the technology to it. Yeah, I, in both of these, you know, you touched on that infrastructure is very important. Obviously, the data doesn't move without an infrastructure to move it. And, you know, the last thing you want is an inferior infrastructure causing a problem with your system, because ultimately, it's your name, you know, it, it's your logo on that, <laughs> what everyone's seeing. Yeah. How, I assume you have a similar point of view on infrastructure, Drew? Yeah, I mean, it's it's essential. It's really step one, right? If you had a, a Ferrari in the road and there was potholes all, all covering the road, the, the car's not going to go very far. You're not really going to get your your bang for your buck out, out of that vehicle. Uh, so no, no matter what device you're using, if you don't have the right infrastructure, you're not, you're not going to get the capabilities out of the device and you're not going to look good to your customer and your customer is not going to be happy. And I think cameras have been around for a real long evolution of buildings and so on. Um, and they go all the way back to coax and AC power. So tell me about the benefits of using PoE in the current, uh, in current construction. Yeah, it's, it's PoE is simpler for integrators to, to work with. They have one cable for, for power and data uh, that, that's delivering everything that's what you need. Uh, in, in some cases, there might be installations where installing power is really expensive. Uh, maybe in, in a lot of cases, it, it's it's standard, but um, maybe there's no power uh, devices any, anywhere you need to put a camera in. Maybe it's in an elevator or something like that. Uh, so having the ability to do one cable for both power and data is is really essential. And it was a, a huge step forward for, for our industry in, in terms of making things easier and more cost effective. How has it impacted uh, your business, Tertia? So don't ask me too technical a question because my technical skills are going to run out. And all I can tell you is, you know, we run all our sensors off PoE and it's great. It's so easy to install because we plug it in and we've got both power and data and it's stable and it just works. And like you said earlier, if it doesn't work, it really makes us look bad, which does happen if we, if we try and use something else you know, the Wi-Fi goes down and now our sensors don't work. And the call normally starts with your sensors not picking up any data. And then it's back, 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 back. Okay, the, well, the, the IT guys are working on the Wi-Fi network. So it really is our preferred way to work. And the sensors we, we um, install at customers are used all over the world. And typically, you know, POE is just every discussion we've got, uh, we have, we say, isn't that, what infrastructure do you need? POE infrastructure. If you've got that, our sensors can run. If you don't have it that, it is a global standard. Re-engineer, have different discussions, lots of meetings. But just having that makes it so easy, and it makes it so easy to deploy anywhere in the world. So it's become quite critical for us. Yeah, and we deal with a lot of multinational customers as well. So POE being a global standard, they can deploy the same exact system here as anywhere else in the world and have that standardization lowers their design costs, makes it easier to manage and maintain, keeps their data, their platforms uh, seamless and, uh, and unified. So yeah, a lot, a lot of benefits there. Uh, you know, interesting, you mentioned that the first thing that they're going to come out and say is, hey, your camera doesn't work or your sensor doesn't work. No one's going to look at the infrastructure first, even if they have an inferior infrastructure that could be us. Uh, at the Siemens company, we have a solution, we call it MapIt. 
It actually makes the infrastructure intelligent. It digitizes the infrastructure. And we recommend this for all intelligent building deployments because now if a edge device goes down, we can tell that, okay, yep, it was the network 20 feet outside of TR, maybe someone cut a cable or mispatched something, but we know we can call the low voltage team and get that up and running quickly. Or we say, hey, you know what, we have connectivity all the way out to the network card on your sensor, your camera, your door reader, whatever that device is, we think it is actually with the device itself. So it helps. Um, when we look at issues, they say 80% of your time is spent troubleshooting and only 20% is spent actually fixing the problem. So when we can help narrow that down, that is huge for, uh, for the end user whoever's operating that building. People don't think of systems in terms of mitigating risk. You know, we have cameras to watch trip and fall, point of sale, HVAC to keep air healthy so that people don't get sick and are productive. So when a system is down, be it a sensor or anything else, that end user, whoever's responsible for that building is in a position of greater risk than they should be. And getting those back online quickly is, is very important. So, yeah. Uh, with either of your systems, in the structured cabling world, we talk with, uh, in 100 meter increments. That's uh, the typical channel. Do any of your sensors or cameras, um, do you allow them to go beyond that 100 meter distance that we talk about in the standards, or do you try to keep things within that 100 meters? Ours is ahead, definitely Fisher. within, definitely within, actually much lower than 100 meters. We probably work in a 50 meter range. Okay. Would that be from the switch port to the sensor, 50 meters? Okay. Uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on distances? Yeah, there are POE extenders that can, can enable to you to go over the 100 meters, but we always stress to to test things out. You know, just because just because it says it can do it on paper, uh, we, we want you to test before you actually buy it and install it. Uh, so you know whether it's a, it might be a small fixed dome camera is drawing a lot different power than a, than a large pan tilt zoom camera. Uh, so yeah, you, you can utilize these PO extenders and that can be very useful. But uh, we just stress to, to test test before you actually count on that uh, to make sure it's going to work as you intended. So the best rule of thumb really is stay within the 100 meters or shorter. Uh, does fiber come into play when we're talking about edge connectivity? Yeah, Sorry, fiber you just is a thing. Second ball? Sorry, could you just repeat that for me? Yeah, if fiber comes into play. Uh, if you ever use fiber for connectivity to get longer distances, I know that in a lot of cases, um, you're still bringing power to that device, but does that, uh, does that factor into it sometimes? Good, Drew, I'll start yeah. with you. Yeah, um, I think fiber is is a question that we're seeing more often these days. Uh, there's a couple of devices that have slots for, for fiber. Uh, it's probably not something that people lead with, at least from, from my perspective, but it's it's something that's it's a really uh, exciting, innovative piece of technology. And I, I think slowly a lot of, a lot of people are, are realizing that there is there's a lot of benefits to using fiber and, and you know when they, they can identify those spots to use it over other forms of cabling uh, then then it's there's there's some big fans that, we, that we've seen come back to us about that so so it's a growing trend from from our eyes for sure is it great Tertia? saying what drew said just starting to see that interest but not quite rolling it out yet but having those discussions definitely starting to look at right. those options so when we do a uh, a second um, of, of this event uh, a year or so from now, then there'll be more conversation on the fiber side, maybe. <laughs> ah, very good. So uh, COVID obviously impacts everything that we do right now. Um, and it doesn't even have to be COVID specific because really what I think COVID is teaching us is that we need to be able to adjust at a moment's notice to anything that is thrown at us. What are you doing now uh, in the space to deal better with COVID today, but also for the unknown, for whatever is coming next. Uh, Tersh, you want to start that off? So you're absolutely right. And I agree with you where you said that COVID has really forced us out of our comfort zone. It's really forced us to look at things in a brand new way. We have to adjust. We have to be agile. 
but also I find a kind of a journey as COVID started and where we are now and I don't want to say come back and hasn't really moved on away is you know initially if I think those first few months everyone was working from home and all the articles were about the office is dead you know everyone's working from home is the way of the future we should have done it ages ago that's that's the way it's going to be no one's going to use offices anymore and fast forward a few months our clients are starting to see that value of the office it's not just a desk it's not just a space to work it's all about human connections and human interactions so a great example i have a friend who works for an investment bank and after months of working from home interacting on teams or whatever every single day they finally saw each other face to face for this first team meeting a month and he said you know what was fascinating to him is they have they've had this problem that they've been kind of struggling to sort out over the last few months and he said we suddenly saw each other face to face and we said the thing that we're struggling with he says it was a 10 minute conversation face to face and they sold it and what this is teaching us is the office has a space it has it is here to stay but it needs to change it needs to look different and those are the discussions that we've got now is how does the technology change is the office space itself, people are coming to the office to collaborate. They're coming to the office to meet with their colleagues. And how do you manage that? And what's quite interesting is um, when we speak to some early customers who've actually been going to the office for the last few months already, they're going, no, we've got this person who shouts at us every day, but what she does is every single week, she manages who's allowed to come to the office with reduced capacity. How do we make sure you know people don't get too close together? And the technology evolves with it. So initially when it came out social distancing was key and our sensors we upgraded our sensors to allow notifications when people get within that two meter kind of social distancing space and after one day not two days after one day i had a client phone me and said please turn this off i can't handle this <laughs> he says, I, like every few minutes we get a notification people are just too close together and he says then we have to run up if you run up take looks we have to get to those floors shout at the people he says and they all you know old and overpaid and like really that's not the discussions we should be having with them but like this kind of shift is going to we're not going to police you yes the technology allows us to give you a notification if you're within that space but that's not actually the solution the solution is how do we educate people how mm -hmm. do we educate people yeah. to what they do and let's use the technology to kind of facilitate and make this easier. So our technology says, well, what's my reduced capacity? Who can come to the office when? And it just automatic, as my one ex-colleague used to say, automatically makes it happen. Everyone gets a notification to say, Bob, you can come to the office Monday and Friday. Tertia, you can come Tuesdays and Thursdays. But please tell us when you're going to come. So we know when you're going to be here. We can say we can manage the number of people who come into the building. Being more proactive now, limiting the number of people coming into the building, we know exactly who's going to be there. And we even tell you in advance, before you get to your floor and your old desk and someone sitting there, that we can say, sorry, this floor is full. You can't come and work here on Thursday. If you want to come on Thursday, you have to go to floor three. There's still space mm -hmm. available there. So it's kind of a shift towards more proactively managing our office space and our people from a COVID perspective. And that's just yeah. one example. Got a million more. That's great. And Drew, what are your thoughts on you know how your things, the way we're applying your systems, are changing our ability to deal with these uh, situations? Yeah, I completely agree with what Tersha just said with the occupancy sensor sensors going off. You know, every uh, all, all the time, right? Uh, I think when COVID first started, people thought, okay, I'll just buy this device and it'll solve our problems. We'll, we'll be good yes. to go. And it, 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 they quickly learned that's not really the case. But that technology can still be very valuable in in helping mitigate some of these issues. It's just not going to be they're not they're not medical devices, right? Uh, but there are certain things you can do, like going into a building, and uh, maybe you don't need to actually touch the doors to get in. Maybe maybe there's touchless entry with the access control system. Uh, maybe a, a company with consent could load uh, images of, of employees, and they could just look at the camera, smile, and, and go in. Uh, without once again without touching the doors maybe there's you know if people are walking around without masks you could have the uh, a speaker kind of subtly say hey can you please put a mask on without getting in their face but but maybe a, a gentle reminder 
So there's a lot of things that can help people as they get back to the office or, or just, you know, if, if that's what they want to do or, or just be safe in general. Uh, the technology can, can definitely sort of be a, a help with, with doing that. But it's, at least in our case, it's, it's not going to solve the whole thing for you. Uh, so I, I think it's really important for companies to just to develop a plan on their own to, to manage the risk so they can ensure safety with uh, going by the, the, the local governance and, and what they say. Yeah. I so, want to add, if, if you don't mind, I want to add one more thing to it. One of the other things we're seeing is, you know, I spoke earlier about the office being too cold or too hot. And until recently, there was very much a focus of people comfortable in the office so that they can work comfortably. What's about being cold or hot? And now companies are definitely looking at this differently. They're going, hmm, is our building healthy? Are the aircons actually yeah. filtering out the air? Um, you know, now we want to let more fresh air into the building. So there's a, a definite shift to go. It's not just about sanitizing. It's not just about how many people and keeping away from each other. It's, is that building actually healthy? And how do we make sure that our people don't get sick? Not just COVID, but sick in general. So that shift sure. we start to see as well. Yeah, it, you know, the bulk of our conversation has been getting people into the building, making sure they're distanced and all the, you know, finding conference rooms and so on. But at some point people leave and when they leave, the building needs to be cleaned. So how are we using this data to uh, perhaps be more thorough in our cleaning or perhaps be more economical in our cleaning? Uh, what are we doing when people aren't in there, Drew? Yeah, I think that issue could be, could be solved a lot with what, what, Church's company does in, in occupancy sensors and seeing, you know, who was in this room, what was the, you know, was there rooms that were used more often than others, so you can focus resources to make sure that that things are cleaned. And on top of that, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other ways you could sort of supplement that. Uh, for instance, we have a, a partner and they, it's a video analyst company, and it, it could run directly on the camera, uh, where it's looking at a scene. And you basically ask it a question, you know, how many coffee cups, how many chairs are there? And then it's solving that for you. So if you have the occupant sensors and you know, okay, this is where the rooms that, that were hot spots. And then from, from within that, you could say, you know, what is moved in here? Is, is the coffee cups moved? Did, did somebody rub the pencil all over their face? Um, just kind of whatever, whatever question would, would help supplement that uh, might, might do something to, to help, uh, prioritize resources because it's, it's probably a big resource intensive effort for companies just to to go and actually clean so you know, how can they make that process itself more efficient yeah Tush, you want to add to that um absolutely so um one of our customers had these cleaning crews that would literally clean every single desk every single day consistently on every single floor and like you said it's massive just cleaning teams you know, there were 10 people in, in the building and us, and they were just more cleaners actually in the building. And once we installed the occupancy sensors, every day we tell them exactly which desk was occupied, exactly which meeting room was occupied. So now they know exactly where they need to go and clean. So it's just so much more efficient and they get to the places they really need to, because by trying to get to every single desk every single day, they would leave out a full because they couldn't get to it. Mm -hmm. They'd only get there tomorrow and, you know, so now it's much more efficient. Give them a report every single day and it's actually a picture. It's like a floor plan every single desk and they give it to the cleaners and they go, these are the desks people sat at, these are meeting rooms that were occupied. And if people Have... want, sorry, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. And if people want an even more kind of faster clean, not just at the end of every day. So we typically starting to see this with meeting rooms now. So we had a few people in the meeting room, we had less people than we did before, but it's, like, it's still an enclosed space. And we've got this tiny little touch sensor that we, it's tiny and it connects to a dock and you have lots of sensors connected to this one dock, which is connected by a POE. Is someone just touches it at the end of the meeting. And what that does, it sends a notification to a cleaning team to go quickly come in and clean Cloud City. And that's much more efficient as well. Yeah, so basically we're, we're targeting now, more targeted with our cleaning resources, our maintenance resources, to make sure that the, the places that are being overused or used heavily are getting the thorough cleaning that they need, while places that are not being used at all, let's not waste our time, money, or anything else, uh, you know, in those areas. That's great. Huh. Are there any other aspects of the operations of a building that you see 
this data could uh, impact either for uh, for savings or for just uh, being more thorough, similar to cleaning. I'm struggling to I'm think sorry. of one, so I threw it out to you guys. <laughs> so many, um, there. <laughs> from health and safety to um, it's just I think it all all starts okay, start with what problem do you want to solve? But we typically get customers who go. I can actually ask, what do our employees do every day? So you have to go away from the technology and away from the sensors and cameras and everything just for a moment and speak to the humans who use your building every day. And we actually talk them through, like, talk us through your day. Like, what are the frustrations? And, you know, it was always, I can't find a meeting room, I can't find space to work. Now it's, is there other people at the coffee station so I can quickly walk down? Or, you know, I might find a meeting room quickly, but the canteen is so busy during lunch every day that it takes me two hours just to get something. So it's, okay. there's so many applications that are, we're starting to see being used for us. Awesome. Drew? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really uh, a wide variety of, of, of things you could do. Uh, like I said before, that, you know, the company that, that essentially lets you ask a question to what are you seeing right now? What's what's in your view? What do you want to know? Is the computer on? Is the computer off? Is is the coffee full? Uh, you know, anything that you might be able to to view is something that you can now turn into data that either could be used by by management or or user or, or a building owner, whoever it may be. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the the possibilities are kind of growing and growing by by the month here, and it's it's exciting to see. Uh, from from our perspective, we're just trying to be as open as possible. So yeah. you know, we're 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 hardware. We have this platform. We actually call it uh, Access Camera Application Platform. So we're not we're not the the smart people building all the the analytics that are you know driving driving the world. But we know that those are out there. So what can we do to open up our our cameras and devices to those things? So this this platform we call ACAP. Uh, developers can put uh, applications right onto the the edge devices, and then that solves whatever problem the, the end user might need that there's probably hundreds of these companies out there doing things like this and the fact that it's on the camera edge device itself means that there's no server costs there's less latency uh, so it's it's a better experience for the end user and it's exciting for for everyone else because they're really pushing into new fields and in solving problems that we haven't really been able to, to solve before uh, so it, it's exciting for for all of us uh, and that can apply to to cleaning buildings but really sort of any other issues that sure. people might want to attack. Great, excellent point of views, both of you, thank you. So uh, at this time, uh, I, I wanna give your voices a break for a moment. And uh, Brian, behind the scenes, is gonna pop up a uh, one last poll question that we have for everyone. And then we're gonna circle back uh, for closing thoughts from both of you. So uh, this last poll question is uh, very simple. Would you like one of the panels to reach out to you to answer any of the questions or discuss any opportunities that you have? Please uh, take a second and um, and click one of the buttons. Great. All right, uh, Brian, if you don't mind, we'll take that down and uh, and we'll come back here. Uh, Drew, thank you for joining us today from Access Communications. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave people with? Yeah, I just wanna sort of remind people back to my original point is that uh, when you think of Access, it's not necessarily just a camera company. We're, we're in the business of, of solving issues with, with our devices for the customers, whatever they may be, uh, with the, the network devices being cameras, speakers, access control, door stations, and. And there's really multiple things you can do with the devices. It's really exciting because you can tie it into whatever you want and, and occupancy, occupancy sensors, different software, and whatever you have installed at the building, the goal is to be able to, to tie into that and, and seamlessly and really not be an issue for you at all. Uh, and finally, we're, we'd like to stress that there's a lot of intelligence at the edge, that the devices are not just doing one thing and, and, and sort of dumb devices per se, that there's really a lot you can do uh, on the edge device in, in a variety of applications and it's exciting because it, it really ties into kind of all, all three of our, our operations here and in, uh, intelligent buildings in, in a wide variety of applications. 
Great, thanks. Uh, exciting is definitely um, the operative word. It, it, intelligent buildings is such an exciting space right now. Tersha, your thoughts? Oh, final thought is just to say that don't just look at intelligent building as the building itself. I think the biggest saving or the biggest return on investment is when you look at occupants, when you look at employee productivity, that number that I that I mentioned earlier, like how to actually cost and show the cost, the productivity lost by just doing silly things. So really focus on the occupants of the building, start by asking questions, talk us through your day, talk us through your frustrations. And really the technology is so easy to implement and so easy to use by employees. The one company we worked at, we said, how would you describe you know, the new building with the technology that you use? And they said, a great day at work. And that's really what intelligent, if I can sum it up, what intelligent building can mean. It's, it's a great day at work, plus the, all the cost savings and optimization that really transform your, transforms your business. Great, thank you for that. And you know, from my perspective, uh, it's really about thinking about your building early on, understanding where the capital cost savings can come in, which lay that foundation to enable all of these other systems, sensors, cameras, and, and other devices in the building, and tying that all together, again, to solve the problems, to create that better, more productive environment. Uh, so on behalf of Drew and Tertia, I wanna thank everyone very much for joining us today. Uh, the podcast or the uh, today's panel discussion will be recorded and uh, or was recorded and we'll send that out to everybody uh, over the next few days. So thank you, Drew. Thank you, Tersha. It's been a pleasure uh, being on the call together. Thank Thanks you very much. Have a good night, everyone.